Thank you. Thanks for having us on today. What you're going to hear is a bit of a summary of experience from the last 20 years of using systems analysis for natural resource management in the marine side of Australia. It's not all my work. There's other people, including Fabio and Ingrid, that helped me put this together, but there's a, there's a large body of work that this draws from. So as an ecosystem modeler in Australia for the last 20 years, I had to start off by proving that we weren't a fad, that we were actually an evolution of technology in particular, moving things like fisheries from single species to ecosystem or system perspectives to socio-ecological systems today. As a science, systems are very developed now in the marine world. They no longer have to prove themselves at the table. There's more than 5,000 different ecosystem models around the world of different kinds, many different packages right to the global scale now. So on the science side, it's very developed. On the management side, it's still in its infancy. There's very few places that take a systems approach to management still. Camilla, for instance, does. The Marine Stewardship Council now has ecosystem and systems-based ideas in its eco-certification. But in a day-to-day -day management sense, it's largely in places like America or Australia or Europe that take this systems approach. In Australia, a lot of the development of sustainable fisheries over the last 20 years has been based on what's called management strategy evaluation. So this is where science comes in to help the decision, the decision makers think about how they want to do that management. So taking a systems approach to planning the management and the policy in the first place. Uh, that's seen the majority of Australia's fisheries now become su sustainable, so it has been a successful approach. The idea is to do the kind of planning that you just heard about outside the modelling domain, get the vision, the objectives that people want, and then inside, inside the simulation, then you represent the biophysical world, but also all the different human parts of the system as well. So it's not just about painting a scenario and, and thinking about where that pathway will go. It's about fundamentally thinking about the feedback loops that could undermine or cause unintended consequences about what you're trying to achieve. So that's not just how the humans use the system, but even how the science is done and how it reports back to the decision-making process. And ultimately, at the other end, you get an evaluation table. So it's not about optimization, it's about presenting the pros and cons of the different approaches to everybody involved. So an example of this was in Australia's southeast fishery. It's our biggest fishery, you know, sort of in the number of species, in the area that it covers, that kind of stuff. It's pretty small by world standards. Australian fisheries are pretty, pretty small. But uh, it, it's our big fishery. And in the 2000s, at the turn of the century, it was facing social, economic and environmental degradation. It wasn't meeting any of its objectives under the regulations and everybody agreed that something had to be done. I don't have time here to present the details of the systems models that went into that, but we used a management strategy evaluation approach across the entire ecosystem and all the different fisheries activities happening there and all the different species. And ultimately what came out of it wasn't just a restructuring of that fishery, but a $220 million restructuring of all Australia's federal fisheries, and ultimately a progression from that to a systems-based uh, look at how you do handle uncertainty in making fisheries decisions, how you cope with multi-species outcomes. So now about 85% of Australia's fish stocks are on a sustainable basis. So in that sense, it's been an incredibly successful process. One of the key lessons it took to the managers was that they were very very blinkered in the way that they'd been thinking, even with 20 years of support from the scientists already under their belt, and with an egalitarian approach to the management decision-making processes where environmental NGOs and recreational fishermen and industry and scientists all have to advise the managers equally and be in a room to have the kind of interactive discussions you've just heard about from Jill. So the managers even then thought the best way of approaching some of these management challenges was just to put a quota on everything, to regulate every single species of the 450 that are caught, you know, put a quota on everything. And ultimately, the simulations show that that didn't work. People figured the way to game the system. What you needed to do was take that broader systems approach to bring in the social ties, the social taboos and the pressures on people, how industry reports its information to use a whole bunch of different management methods, spatial management, gear management, individual transferable quotas to make sure that management intention and what actually was achieved was aligned across the multiple objectives that you have to deal with from the ecosystem habitats and the fish stocks but through to delivering economically and socially. So all of that was such a resounding success that you know, when the question started coming up in the broader coastal and ocean space, it seemed like the logical next step to take the systems approach 
and apply it to those questions too. So the models that were developed around that didn't just consider the biophysical world, like the ecosystems and the habitats, but went across all of the different industries that are now active in the coastal zone, from tourism and energy generation, uh, and even coastal agriculture and things like that, up through the human society and the social networks and connections, how people do political lobbying. So the whole system was being represented. The reason that that was important to do is Australians are a coastal species. They're a bit of ahead of the game. The rest of the world is supposed to catch up to us in being so coastally oriented by the end of the century. 98% uh, of our uh, population lives within what we call the cooey of the coast, so a yell of the coast. 85% live right, you know, within a half an hour's drive to an hour's drive of the coast. So it's really important that we think about the future of these coasts, in part because all of the revolution that's happened on land is now moving into the ocean. So we've kind of filled up the land, so now we're going to do it to the ocean. It is 75% of the planet or more, after all. So oil and gas generation, you know, aggregate mining, every activity that you can think of land is moving into the oceans as well. These are some pictures from China where you can't tell as you fly over the coast where the ocean ends and the land begins. There's you know, thousands of fishing, like 30, 40,000 fishing vessels, huge aquaculture, living cities that are actually floating. There are enormous aquaculture plantations. I'm an Australian who likes to go to the beach a bit by myself, so the idea of going to the beach in China is a bit horrific for me. Uh, but it is the kind of things we want to be forewarned about to make sure that as that kind of intensity of use potentially develops throughout the Pacific region and throughout the world, that we're a bit ahead of the game. Instead of trying to play chase up to restore fish stocks like we do with fisheries, get ahead of the game to make sure that we're sustainable in how we use our coasts and oceans. So the natural instinct of humans and what we see around the world is to say, look, we'll just chop up everything. It's worked on the land. We'll have a paddock for this and a paddock for that and a paddock for that. We won't mix anything. It'll be all fine. It'll work. We'll have space for everything. Unfortunately, that's a very 2D human version of the world. The oceans have this thing called advection. The water moves backwards and forwards. It's also 3D, it's not 2D, which means that it's a mess if you try to just use spatial management. It's not a solution by itself. And so you've got to take that broader systems perspective to move things forward. So armed with all the knowledge of what had worked in the fisheries world, the level of engagement, recognising that indigenous and local knowledge had equally as much to provide as scientific information. The Aboriginal Indigenous culture, for instance, has almost geological scale knowledge of ecology embedded in their stories to tease out. So taking all of that together, we thought we we're in a good place to find some really considered options for thinking about the futures of coast in Australia. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. So what we did was we did the classic thing that you've just heard from Jill. You check your ego at the door, you grow the skin of a rhinoceros and Thickness as a modeler, everything is wrong is your fault. Uh, you have clear communication about what's going on. You take the time to build the trust. A friend of mine from geology who had never experienced this before started tracking everything we did. And more than 43% of the time spent on this was in building the trust in getting those conversations going and the backwards and forwards, which absolutely astounded him because that's never costed him to a project. Uh, and we worked with people iteratively. We didn't just take a message, go away for two years, come back and present an answer. It was truly integrative and it still faltered. So why is that? If we're really going to use systems in the way that we hear works and we're going to do it at national and global scales, how are we actually going to get over the fact that as you go up in space and up in the number of people, the classical approaches aren't easy and face some significant challenges. And it's not just that the Aussies got it all wrong, that we somehow messed up been talking a lot to other people with a lot of experience, like Carl Walters, and he's found exactly the same thing. It's a constraint of adaptive management and of the systems approach, that as you scale up the number of people involved, it gets much, much harder to successfully get uptake. So I'd argue that technically, there's still heaps we can learn to do about modelling. I'm not trying to shortcut anybody who's about to give a talk in the next couple of days. But fundamentally, we have some way of representing pretty much every ecological process. Similarly, for most of the human processes, we have some way of representing them in, in one form or fashion. I'd say the biggest hole, and one of the first challenges I'd like to throw out there is, from my perspective, we still don't do the evolution of institutional dynamics very well. There's not a lot of information on it, so it's hard to even get your starting models going. But it's going to be fundamental if we're thinking about reshaping the world. So that's challenge number one. The next one is how do you deal with 
14 orders of magnitude. So if you're doing biophysical modeling and you have to think about subgrid scale processes of what are those micro behaviors conditioning the macro outcomes, that's 14 orders of magnitude in the marine world. Um, even the managers have to deal with between four and five orders of magnitude from the beach up to the, the national response. So that means that you have to be clever about scales, not just on the technical mathematical side of doing the modeling, which is a whole talk in itself, but in how you deal with the human side of that as well. So if we think about the way that you can break up systems across different dimensions or different facets of the system and different scales, I'd say that while there's always more information we can collect and always more understanding to be, to be sought and how it changes through time, we do have a reasonable idea of which processes <coughs> fall out where. Mathematically, I think we have a lot of experience of doing modeling well at the individual or the global scale, kind of the extremes. We're a lot poorer in the middle. Those intermediate scales are something we haven't nailed as well yet. It's hard to just expand a, a small model up, but equally in trying to simplify a global model down or add in some of the extra detail gets equally challenging. But fundamentally, I think some of our biggest gaps are still around that human dimension, that human cultural representation. We do economics. There's lots of debate about how economics relates to human behavior and that kind of stuff, but there's still the social aspects and the management and institutional stuff that we have yet to nail. And part of that comes to jurisdictional complications, and this is partly what undid us. So Australia had a national oceans policy. Um, it dissolved, basically. It came up, and then that office doesn't even exist anymore. And it's partly because, to put it bluntly, humans are very much like two-year-olds their entire life. If it looks shiny, it's theirs. If it's broken, it's someone else's problem. And you still see that in the way that you get management interactions happening. And there's such a legacy history of the silos of, you know, people have power, they know their silo, they know what they're in charge of, that the idea of an all-encompassing systems approach to management just failed. It was too big a leap for people to come with us. The models um, that inform some of that decision processes, it was a brave move by a politician, um, said that integrated management across all the different sectors is the way to the best outcomes. Fundamentally, it didn't work, though, because of human interaction. So we have to find a halfway house. And maybe focusing on the cumulative impacts where things do overlap and they do have to recognise that they're better off working together is a place to start. It's ultimately not the place we want to end. So again, the models show that under extreme climate change, if you just stop at that halfway house, you might as well... Well, if you stop at having single sector management, you might as well be doing nothing under an RCP 8.5. You do need that integrated approach. But to get over some of the hurdles to get there, we have to think about the fact that the people we're talking to are time poor, they're already in a very busy life, and this, they see this systems approach as just adding extra constraints on them. Now I have to think about them as well as me. You know, it's just too much. It's also, for them, there's a high turnover in the political world and even in the advisors, managers world, so while you think you're interacting with stakeholders, our biggest problem was we'd be lucky if we got the same group to this uh, two or three meetings in a row, even within nine month period. Try taking that out to four years and you could be pretty much sure that the modelers were the only people that were there for every single meeting the whole way along. There's such a huge turnover that the stakeholder process was devalued because it wasn't the same stakeholders. You were forever reintroducing people to the concept. There's also the distrust of models. People assume that they're not modelers. They don't think about the fact that they model all the time, every single day. So they, f they feel like they don't have a trust. So you have to build that trust. And when the model says something they don't want to hear, despite the fact that lots of Western culture like to now tell us that nerds are cool, as a nerd who cops it all the time, nerds are still not cool. We're the easiest ones to blame. Like there must be something we've put in the model that's given that answer that I don't like, so we'll just write it all off. It's your fault. But as a modeler, we also have to appreciate that science is just one voice that these people are listening to. It, you know, for us, it's the most important voice, but for them, they're trying to evaluate whether it's a voice that they take on board or discard. So trying to be the honest broker is really important and something you have to keep to, even at the risk of the criticism, which is something we get a lot, um, or that you're in the pocket of industry or you're in the pocket of con conservation. So I have a friend of mine who works for NOAA, and he's... Rule of thumb is if he's being sued by p equally many people from the conservation industry economists, then he's probably doing the right thing. 
It's the same kind of thing as for my work. If I've got equally many people saying, oh, you're, in the, you're under the conservationist thumb or you're under the industry's thumb, then they're probably right that I've got the balance right in trying to get as many different aspects covered as possible. Something that um, a person I work with called Ingrid has realised also is that we assume that someone's willingness to simplify, to put something into a systems model, is easier the less that they know. They're happy to gloss over the details if they don't really know the details. What we're increasingly finding, though, is it's actually the opposite, that people who are desperately trying to understand what's going on will latch on to a detail and see that as really important and then say, well, if that detail's important, then every detail's important. And so that you're not really comfortable with simplifying until you know a lot. There's some people that never give up on detail that you can argue till you're blue in the face and they're never going to give up on the detail. But largely, the more familiar with the topic you are, the more comfortable you are saying, yeah, that simplifying detail is okay, or that functional form is okay. So that's something that you have to fight with as well. But one of the chief things that I found was a stumbling block in getting the models was that people assume that you're after a crystal ball, even when you weren't actually. So when they, you couldn't exactly reproduce what, the, what they'd seen, then they said, well, none of it's worth it. They hadn't appreciated that the increased rigour of their thinking and taking on the system's idea and thinking was actually a much, much greater outcome for the performance of their ma subsequent management decisions than whatever the model actually said. So part of that was around educating their mental model. So we've spent a lot of time for people who grew up in geology and mathematics and marine biology, reading about psychology and all of those kind of things and asking people questions, getting them to paint as their mental models. A lot of their mental models are nowhere near a system's idea that you could run them from the past to the present to the future. There's quite a lot of emotion tied up in mental models. It's not just about what the world, how the world is put together. And they also have static versions of the past, the now and the future that are actually inconsistent with each other. You can't make them smoothly connect. So that makes it a little bit difficult to just try and capture everyone's mental models as you, as you run forward. But it also means you have to be careful when you're trying to use mental models to discuss a topic. There's been a lot of consideration of this in the climate space where, for instance, if you talk about the greenhouse effect or climate being like a blanket, it's easy to get across and it's kind of physically closest to the truth. But then people don't see how they can ease it off. Whereas, and similarly with addiction, if you present carbon use as an addiction, they find it, they get a little bit scared, they think it's hard to give up on them, which it likely is, but it's not the mental response that you're actually trying to encourage. So if you present it as a bathtub, or equally like a disease, people get it a bit easier. Bathtub, everyone can turn off a bathtub. Um, how well they do that in a cumulative impact sense, there's a lot of work showing that we're not very good at that, but at least the concept of turning off a bath, they get the idea of. And even more with disease, they can suddenly see that there's treatment options, and that's a positive hope, and that's the part that you're trying to, to trigger. It's also been interesting to us that this distrust of models seems to be not even-handed. So we've had quite a few situations where in presenting a systems model, someone has said, why the hell should we trust your model? We're not modelers, we don't trust models. And literally in the very next sentence they go, the economic projections say, and it's like, well, wait a minute, that's a model too, guys. And some would argue even less tied to reality and to some of the things that we just presented. So we're trying to understand whether that's an accident of history, that's just something we have to live with, or is there some formula that the economists have used that have made their models more palatable, or at least more familiar to what's going on? How do we get that kind of familiarity with systems approaches? And at least part of that's tied to the messages we've found. So if you break up the desires and intentions and beliefs of people, a lot of the economic messages we get, like a bad budget coming down that's going to be really tough, it's always presented that's a short-term pain for, and then we'll be back again. Whereas a lot of the systems outcomes is that you fundamentally have to trade off different properties. And so that's why you, we get a lot of pressure as we try to publish for a journal editors saying, Where's the win-win solution? I can't sell this as a great paper if there's no win-win solution. Well, there's fundamentally not a win-win solution in most situations, okay? So mentally, we love them, but not really that regal. If you can find them, great, but you'll kill yourself looking half the time. So that's a, a challenge that people have to get over. It's also um, about how to simplify the message, but do it in a way that improves focus. So, for instance, Daniel Kahneman has spent a lot of time showing that people like short thinking and snappy simplification, but it's actually when they take the time to think that they get a better, 
better outcome. And that's particularly a challenge over non-linearities, long time frames, all the things that we're not particularly good at. So for us, it's fundamentally been about rethinking the way that we do interdisciplinarity as well. So a good friend of mine, Alad Bundy, presented it much this way. So a lot of biophysical scientists by background think they're helping social scientists if they let them be the cherry on the top. You know, yep, we tick that box at the end, we've got a social scientist to do some part of this. Not really integrated. What you want is a tiramisu rather than a cupcake with a cherry. You want the social science in there as mixed up as possible so that they're doing real social science. They're not just stuck on the end. So they're looking at trust, they're looking at understanding, they're looking at social interactions. They're fundamentally doing real social scientists that they find value in and that they feel valued in and actually doing. And the value to doing that is that most humans can think very focused, very fine scale, very reductionist. There's a few broad scale people who usually get comments on their reports like could do better in chemistry, it's not about buckets, you know, mixing large things together. Um, but you can train the brain of the reductionist thinkers to think broad scale. We have had a bit of a look at this as well and part of it was to show people why they needed these computational models to help thinking. So they'd say, your model only got it right 75% of the time. So we said, okay, with your mental models, how well do you do? And we showed with experience, particularly when there's a group of very experienced experts over different areas who actually had some systems background behind them just through experience, they did pretty well, but it took a lot to get there. It took a lot of learning to get nearly as well as the model was doing just on the basis. So you can educate people to be systems thinkers, but it can take a lot of time to get there. So one of the fundamental things we're now trying to think about uh, is as systems thinkers, can we take some of the messages and some of the learnings from the way that we do it and put it into the tools that people feel comfortable using? So they're like these additive GIS things where they layer up all the layers. You know, there's no good giving them a beautiful systems model if it sits on the shelf and they never ever use it, which has been our experience. So can we take some of the learnings of those integrated systems things and bring them back to the tools they actually want to use? So some technologies will help in making systems fast enough. It goes as well as the GI stuff, but some of it's going to help people do that thinking and some of it and unpacking things. It's a bit like what I'm trying to teach my son at the present moment. He may want a Harley Davidson, but maybe just having an electric push bike would actually achieve what he has to actually get to at least in the interim. So in summary, there's, systems approaches have certainly been a huge major success. There's no way I'm gonna give up on them. And there's hard won, challenge, uh, hard won lessons on how to do it well, and you've heard a lot of that from Jill as well, but those kind of lessons are actually now struggling as they take on new challenges and new scales. So there's some technical challenges around the components like institutional dynamics, but ultimately we have to get more psych psychologists into the mix in doing systems as well. This, particularly if we're gonna try and find some hybrids to work um, moving forward. Oops, thank you.